people first organizations will win in the future of work. Your only real asset is your people. We, we all, all want, want purpose driven work. work. HR led organization is. I'm the sorry, but leaders don't lead empty desks and empty shop floors. Welcome to the People Strategy Leaders Show. I'm your host, Sri Chalapa, founder and president of Engagedly, and a serial entrepreneur in technology, films, and music. This is where we talk to people leaders, business strategists, and organizational savants about leading in the time of change. What is working, what is not working, and more importantly, what we should be thinking about. Stick around to the end of the show. We will reveal how you can be our next guest. And now, let's engage. Hello and welcome to People Strategy Leaders Podcast, and I am Sri Chalapa, co-founder and CEO of Engagely. Today, I'm joined with Sally Loftus. Sally Loftus is the Managing Director of Loftus Partners, a 100% woman-owned human resources consulting firm located in the Blue Ridge Mountains of North Carolina. Loftus Partners specializes in strategy, people, facilitation, and pay justice. Since launching in August 2020, Sally and her firm have worked with 54 clients across three continents. Sally works at the intersection of human resources, organizational development, and social justice. She's a human resources consultant who specializes in people strategy and pay equity. She completed her master's thesis on pay pay equity in nonprofits. Well, welcome to the show, Sally. It's uh, really refreshing to have a new voice in this area. It's one of the topics we have not really talked about on the show. Thank you for asking me to join. I'm excited to be here. Excellent. Um, So one, you know, one question I have, which is something that I think a lot of people probably don't fully understand is what is the issue of pay equity? I mean, people pay based on what the market is, what they think Mm -hmm. they can, the the employee asked for. In fact, I did Mm -hmm. a a little brief on that on LinkedIn is that Mm -hmm. People who get paid the most are the ones who negotiate the best, not the ones who perform the best. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Um, so obviously there's issues with that. People who are more vocal will get more, more mm-hmm. uh, compensation. So talk to me about what are the major issues of pay equity and what does it actually mean? Yeah, I appreciate that you're kind of going back to the beginning on this, right? What is pay equity? Because there's a lot of conversation happening, a lot of things being written about it. So let's kind of talk about what I mean when I say pay equity. So there's a couple of terms in this space that people will typically use, which are pay equity and pay parity. You may hear like equal pay as well. And that's really addressing um, some things kind of at the organizational level and then at the individual level. So first are, you know, for instance, if you have a bunch of accountants, you know, in your company, are all of them being paid in the same way under kind of the same structure um, and gender, race, protected categories are not impacting that. So um, a bigger piece of that is then organizationally, right? People may be in the same salary band level. Are they being paid under the same framework? And could you basically kind of say, you know, if you had to testify in court, you know, this is why we made this decision and it wasn't um, somehow unconsciously based on race, gender, Um that's that's kind of the piece of it so that's kind of from a legal perspective what pay equity is right the bigger piece is really stepping back as a company and saying okay how do we pay our people and is the current structure we're using relevant to today as you know a lot of things have happened um since 2020 the workplace has changed significantly and so what i'm finding are there are so many companies who've not kind of updated their pay framework that they're actually falling behind in the competition uh, for talent. So when you say pay framework, what does that mm-hmm. mean? I mean, are you saying mm-hmm. they're not paying enough? That's a different issue than pay, <laughs> right? There, yeah, kind of what happens is typically I go in with a company and we'll do what's called a pay equity assessment, which is basically we just kind of look at all the pay data from employees and look at it in a lot of different ways at different levels. So some of the issues that I find typically in that one is we might figure out that maybe people within a certain salary band are being paid way differently for no reason base you know mm-hmm. like for instance maybe it was a merger and acquisition and this mm-hmm. pe- this person came in and they were paid higher and it never kind of got fixed um another piece like you said or maybe the minimum pay is not enough 
for that um, company. Also, what I'm finding a lot more of is that a lot of companies, because it's we've had such a labor shortage, at least in the United States in the last few years, is that people have raised the minimum or the frontline pay and have um, not raised everyone else's pay. So like there's this layer that's happening. So you kind of have entry-level workers who've gotten a bump, which they needed to because minimum pay was low. And then you've kind of gotten, you know, senior leaders who've probably gotten a bump because they navigated a really tough transition the last few years. But the people between there have not gotten the same amount of um, pay increases. And so they're actually having salary compression, which companies are not going to know unless they look at their data. Yeah, I've, I've noticed that too. The middle management and the middle layer has uh, been compressed uh, mm-hmm. over, over time because if you're an executive, you can, you can navigate that and work mm-hmm. through with the board or your CEO or whatever to get the pay you want because you're in a critical mm-hmm. role in that company. Mm-hmm. At entry level, you can't hire people if you don't pay them enough with the inflation. Mm-hmm. The way it is, mm-hmm. so they have to compete. But once they've mm-hmm. been there for three or four years or five years and become a manager or even a director, they're seeing maybe a 2%, 3% increase, or if that, you know, because mm-hmm. the, 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 there is inflation that is affecting the company's bottom lines too. But so they are, they're like trying to figure out where not to spend the money, but they still need the best people and replace the people. So um, one issue that we find in Engagely as well is that we end up paying more sometimes to a new hire Mm-hmm. Then people were already there. And so then we have to go back and revise everybody else's pay. So th- that becomes a challenge because you hire one person. Now you got to adjust 10 people's pay because of that one person who came in at a higher salary, higher range uh, at that point. Um, so how per- so that is obviously more broader sense. But mm-hmm. obviously, the discussion on pay equity, when, when you hear about it, you mm-hmm. typically you know, hone into, oh, pay disparity between genders mm-hmm. or race. Mm-hmm or ethnicities mm-hmm. or sexual preferences or mm-hmm. whatever mm-hmm. the demographic criteria is. That's typically where people think when there's an issue with pay equity. So I'm mm-hmm. glad you highlighted the issue is actually even beyond that across mm-hmm. levels uh, mm-hmm. and tenure. Um, how bad is the pay equity in the demographic based pay equity issues? Yeah, I mean, if you just look at gender in the United States, right, um, the Women make 84 cents on the dollar for every man. If you start laying race and ethnicities on top of that, um, things start getting, you know, the gaps are much bigger, Um, especially if you then kind of lay on like, um, for instance, Latina equal pay day is coming up and um, Latina women are typically making about 53 cents on the dollar for a man. Wow. So that's a huge gap. And I will say, when you start looking at these, a lot of companies are not intentionally doing this, right? They're not saying, okay, I'm going to pay this person less because they're this ethnicity. What happens is that they're paying less because of how their qualifications are structured, right? It may be that they, you know, there's some kind of education requirement that's not really needed for the job. There may be some kind of experience that they're really limiting to only people who kind of have had these jobs or um, could have these. So sometimes a lot of times it's really not intentional, but you've got to get into your pay data to really look at that and to understand it and look at it through that lens to really see what you're doing. And I will also say, you know, kind of beyond protected categories is to your point, it can also be a lot bigger. Sometimes I work with organizations where, for instance, all the finance people in that organization are paid the most because a previous CEO thought that the finance department was the most important department right. and so felt like that or maybe an IT department because they had a skill that was really hot at the time you know they had to go pay more for that and have just kind of kept that approach without really kind of coming back and saying okay what what's the market telling us right now yeah yeah especially these days if you have AI in your resume you suddenly get a 10 percent bump uh, <laughs> yeah I I'm mean, I don't know exact numbers there, but definitely there's a mm-hmm. for having it's the right true. Keywords. yeah keywords. But the bigger issue also is negotiating skills, right? Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. In general, and tell me if, if I'm right on this, mm-hmm. men are more vocal about what they want mm-hmm. and more, and they appear more confident, if not necessarily competent, um, <laughs> because you sometimes mix the two. Mm-hmm. And 
so they can negotiate better because of that. You know, even if you watch some of these, you know, shows, you can see and 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 even the organization, you rise up the ranks faster, especially mm -hmm. if, you're, if you're a man, and then you have a man in, in mm -hmm. a female at the top. Mm -hmm. uh, not only that, you know, there's pay disparity and promotion disparity based on how you look, how mm -hmm. you how mm -hmm. tall are you. Right, mm -hmm. <laughs> people who are taller get promoted faster. Um, mm -hmm. But tell me if that, how much of that plays into all of this, or if I'm, or am I on the left field here? No, that's absolutely. There is a lot of research that shows there's a lot of subjectivity in negotiations. Whether it's you're negotiating for a job you're taking at a company, which is always your best time to <laughs> ask for the most money, right? Or you're negotiating oh. a promotion when you're at a company. And so some of those things, and a lot of times it's based on the person that you're asking, right? So let's say it's your supervisor or the hiring manager, their own kind of conscious and unconscious biases and assumptions may be at play in that. And so a lot of times I see a lot of people going to a no negotiation policy in their companies. And I can kind of go either way on that, but it's really about um, understanding there's a lot of bias baked into negotiations. And it can also, it's not just a gender issue. It can be a cultural issue. I mean, people from different countries around the world where it's looked, it's frowned upon to ask for more money, you know, things like that. There's a lot of things in there. So really I work with clients to kind of get to a much more objective type pay framework rather than kind of the subjective of, you know, kind of leaving it all in the hands of one person and what they think. Yeah. And also, you know, we used to have round tables back in, in the day when I was in EY, mm -hmm. uh, where the manager had to defend your, because they restrict how many people can get promoted and, uh, and what the compensation mm -hmm. changes. Mm -hmm. So a lot of them, you're the mercy of your manager's ability to advocate for you, right? So that's also mm -hmm. another issue. And how do you surface that? Yeah, well, and to kind of thinking about, you know, yeah, EY is a big corporation. And I work with a lot of groups, too, who have really tried to flatten their hierarchies. And so they've tried to decrease the number of people maybe between the front line and the CEO. And doing that, it's really, if they're not doing it strategically, have decreased the amount of growth somebody can experience at the company because it's much harder to maybe jump yeah. levels, you know, within the company. And also a lot of times it's you have to supervise people to grow and not everybody's capable of that or wants to do that. And so the individual contributor kind of gets left behind. Yeah. So how do, so let, let's talk a little bit about the approach to solving this mm -hmm. problem. Mm -hmm. So obviously you, you specialize in solving this problem mm -hmm. for organizations, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, but obviously there are things they can do themselves. So what are some of the simple steps they can take as a CEO or as an HR leader mm -hmm. to make sure the pay equity, is, pay equity issues are as minimal as, you will never eliminate it, uh, but as minimal as possible? Yeah, I think the first action is going to be just having a conversation, starting to ask the questions. I'm happy to provide you with a blog post about how to conduct your own pay equity assessment at your organization. And I really encourage groups to just kind of go with a sense of curiosity and not judgment. You're just kind of seeing what's out there and what's happening and it's okay. Everybody's got issues and ha have different issues. So one of, one of those is, is starting the conversation, doing a pay equity assessment. Another t a piece that you could work with a lot of companies do is looking at their compensation philosophy, whether or not they have one, they may, they may have one that says, you know, we want the best people and we're going to pay at the 75th percentile. Well, that's great, but like there probably needs to be a lot more language around that about why you're doing it and why you've chosen that because there's a level of transparency being pushed into the workplace right now, whether it's the laws that are happening here in the United States um, and, uh, and obviously in other countries and places um, or the people coming in saying, you know, wanting transparency. So there's going to have to be some conversations there um, and you're going to have to be a lot more explicit about why you pay the way you do. Um, the couple of other things, you know, again, looking at what your pay raise framework is, is saying, you know, how are we updating our, our pay bands? If you have pay bands, um, how are you benchmarking your data? A lot of times people will purchase reports, which yep. is great, but really trying to be intentional and in saying, okay, who are we really comparing ourselves to? Are we, you know, are we losing people to Amazon, Google, whatever? Can we even compete with them? And if not, what, what are kind of the parameters around which we might compete? 
Another piece is really looking at how you handle cost of living in your pay structures. That has been something that a lot of people have kind of been caught, uh, you know, in the last few years of not having, not really keeping track of that. And so yeah. really looking at, you know, in the United States, the, you know, consumer expenditure survey says that the uh, kind of median place that most households need is about $65,000 a year to make it. And so, you know, there are a lot of people out there who are still paying and, you know, for a full-time job in the thirties and forties and feel good about that. And it's, you're going to have higher turnover. Yeah. I mean, unless you're in a low cost state, like Mississippi or Alabama or or even Missouri in some places, right? Even then, like their cost of living is like fifty one thousand. So it's it's definitely lower um, than, for instance, like a Seattle in DC and San Francisco. That's like a ninety five thousand dollar a year. But yeah, definitely yeah. things have gotten more expensive. Yeah. So when we talk about fixing the pay equity issue. Um, there's pay parity issues. What are some of the things that an, as an employee they can do to advocate for themselves uh, if they feel they're being underpaid? Thank you for bringing up that question because I get that quite a bit from employees. One is I think you got to understand kind of what is your role. Do your own level of kind of benchmarking of what your role is. There are a lot of places that you can go online to look at your role, really focus on what the qualifications are compared to what your qualifications are in that role. Um, sometimes people will be like, oh, you know, I could do this role, so I should be paid this much, but that's not the role you're in, right? You really need to benchmark against what you're currently doing. So try to go get some of that data because a lot of times the ranges are posted in those roles because there are more pay transparency laws now. Um, you can share that information with your supervisor and just, you know, really have a conversation about like, this is what I'm seeing out there. This is what I'm not. You can also advocate for your company to have a compensation philosophy and really try to be more transparent around what's happening. What I'm finding is a lot of companies that are located in places that have passed pay transparency laws is that they're kind of legally compliant by putting the salary ranges into those postings, but then that's the first time the other employees at the um, company are finding out about those pay ranges. Yeah, and yeah. so all of a sudden, you know, they're like, wait, you know, this job that's in the same salary band as me is making more money. So I think kind of keep, keep notes on that. And really, I think just continuing to, to push um, in a, in a kind way, uh, of course, but, you know, to kind of push the conversations because really, what happens is that there's research out there is that, you know, you can leave a job and get a five to 7% bump rather than staying in a job and get a three to 4%. So sometimes you may have to be like, okay, my company's not going to do it. And you may have to leave to get the pay you want. Yeah. Yeah. There are pros and cons to that as well, right? Because mm -hmm. you have familiarity, you go to a new place and you have no idea how the manager really is or the organization culture really is because you only see the the best part you know in the interview process and the and the and on the website and other public places yeah well and you think about benefits i think also you know one thing is that what i'm seeing and i would be curious if you're seeing this too is that it seems like kind of the newer generations in the workforce are expecting pay raises like every 3 to 6 months where typically those happen every 12 months, you know, maybe every 12 to 24 months so i think also having some patience with companies trying to catch up with where things are and um, it takes some time to restructure your pay uh, systems and practices and things like that so sometimes you may have to wait a little bit longer than you than you would like to do so as an employee but you know if you feel like you can trust your organization they're then hoping they're doing the right thing for you and for everyone yeah what i'm seeing is that it really depends on the role if it's a hot market for mm -hmm. a skill set you know if you are in, let's say AI, like I mentioned, mm -hmm. it's a hot market for that. Or if you mm -hmm. are a really strong marketer, digital marketer, it's a hot market for those people. Mm -hmm. uh, and in those areas, you know, because there's a shortage of skills, I mean, there's a lot of people who claim these skills, but the person who truly has those skills and can talk about it, mm -hmm. you know, they will probably want rapid changes in their, in their, in their uh, compensation structure. Um, but you know, well, if you are in in a, a job that can easily be refilled uh, or backfilled, I should say, 
you know, those things are harder to, to do that because it, it's like the lower, it's lower time to onboard and be performing at a high level. Um, like if you, like a call center agent, for example, right? Mm -hmm. I mean, they have a process set up so that they are planning for turnover. They already know they're going to have 20, 30% turnover every year mm -hmm. on a call center or a collection agency mm -hmm. or whatever that is. They already mm -hmm. know that. It's mm -hmm. like, it's, it's, it's a tough job. They've created a process. You just churn and burn through that, right? So it really depends on, on that, I think, uh, to, a, to, a lot, uh, to a lot of extent. But if you have a very unique skill, you know, you're a hot commodity, you definitely can, you know, ask for more frequent. Because every time you look outside, you're like, oh, this job is now paying 150 and I'm only making 120 so you can ask. And then mm -hmm. six months later, another company is advertising the same job for 180 you can go back to the well. So I think it really depends on the, on the role as well. But, but younger generation is definitely... You know, I, I'm kind of in the middle, if you will. Mm -hmm. you know, when I look at my parents uh, and, and our people uh, in, the, you know, in our parental mm -hmm. generation, I mean, they got promoted once every seven years, eight years. Right, yeah. You know, Ten years. Um, mm -hmm. They got standard pay increase was anywhere between 2 to 6%. Six like 6% of a solid increase, you know. Um, and now it's like, if you give somebody 2% or 3%, you, you get laughed at in your face. So you don't even want to bother doing that. You might as well not do any than <laughs> 2%, 2 or 3%. It's well, and I want to speak to the AI thing, if you don't mind for a second, you know, that's a great example of one of those where I might encourage a client to think about, so for instance, there are a lot of people, right, that are hiring for AI right now, especially around generative AI and thinking about helping companies you know, not being necessarily in a reactive mode of being like, okay, everybody's hiring or I need to do something with that. Thinking about, could I hire maybe a contractor or a consultant for six months to help us really figure out what this, you know, what we need and how we want to use it and come up with kind of some case studies before you go hire it, you know, hire for that skill, you might get a better kind of bang for your buck in hiring um, mm -hmm. because then you really have a better idea around the kind of generative AI experience or skill set skill set that you need. Because what I'm seeing is, you know, this is one of those times in the market where there are a lot of companies out there, right, who are saying, we'll sell you AI, you know, all this stuff, especially in HR. HR and AI is like a fascinating topic. Um, but a lot of times those systems are just kind of systems and there's not like really a lot of experience with clients who've used those. So kind of bridging that gap, maybe with a con contractor, consultant, whatever, for a few months to kind of figure out how you want to use it and then hiring the expertise really might be the better play right now. Yeah, yeah, right. And, and, and especially with the AI, the way it's evolving is that you really don't need a lot of AI skills because there are so many tools out there that you can just leverage. So you don't actually need it to build your own AI when other companies are doing it, all you need to do is know is how to use it more effectively for your use cases in your organization. So maybe that AI engineer is really not truly needed to that level of depth. They need to have some understanding, um, but not necessarily to the depth where they're writing AI code. Um, I, I do want to come back to the employee question one more time. Mm -hmm. um, so you mentioned some startling statistics. I was particularly, uh, you know, stunned by the 53 mm -hmm. cents to a dollar or 50% mm -hmm. to a dollar on the Latina women. Mm -hmm. uh, what, so two, two questions, what is driving that mm -hmm. specifically, you know, some, mm -hmm. such big, big pay disparity. I can understand 84, mm -hmm. 90 cents, you know, those, those mm -hmm. things have been there and it's continuously improving, mm -hmm. but that obviously is a huge margin uh, mm -hmm. of disparity. Mm -hmm. So what's driving that? And then what should they do proactively and as an employee? To mm -hmm. make sure? they are being paid fairly? There are several issues. I will, say, I will kind of categorize them into kind of um, individual life circumstances, organizations, and then kind of society, right? So let's look at the individual life circumstances. Um, you may have, you know, not had as much of experience. And I'll say somebody here, you know, in the United States may not have had access to education or ability to work a straight eight to five schedule Monday through Friday, because maybe you have caregiving responsibilities or, you know, are in a transitional housing situation. So that might leave you in a, let's say an hourly job longer, right? Mm -hmm. And then prevents you from progressing because you may not be able to kind of work a traditional schedule. 
another piece, so kind of organizationally what happens is that there's something called the broken rung, which is specifically for women. Um, men tend to get promoted into supervisor, pos- that first frontline supervisor position way more often than women do. And that is a key step in career growth is getting that supervision experience and then being able to build on that. There's also something called the glass cliff. Uh, you may have heard of the glass ceiling, but the right. glass cliff, which is that men are more often chosen for senior leadership roles. So uh, you see a lot of women who are in senior leadership roles, but don't get that CEO opportunity, right? And they top out there. And how that drives around race and ethnicity is, again, it could be kind of individual circumstances, the kind of work you've been able to put on your resume based on when you've been able to work. If you have transportation, if you have secure housing, um, you know, if you have caregiving responsibilities. So organizations really need to look at, like, are we offering some flexible work environments? There's a reason people want to do more remote work. Um, you know, specifically, so many women have left the workforce since the 2020 pandemic because of caregiving. Um, I mean, I could spend a whole podcast talking about the caregiving crisis in um, in the United States. Uh, so Is those are, some are you talking about like for their parents or are you talking about some- it's across I use the term caregiving because it goes across so you know across the situation so it could be uh, caring for aging parents it could be you have a child that has some kind of or a, a partner who has some kind of debilitating circumstance and may need more help it could be obviously having little kids at home or you know there are a lot of older people, grandparents who are raising their grandchildren right now. So caregiving really runs across kind of the age, um, you know, kind of from uh, cradle to death. But Mm -hmm. there's, there are a lot of caregiving responsibilities that are costly, that require schedules that may be a little non-traditional. And um, also there's a caregiving crisis in that child care centers, you know, a lot of people have left care, health care, child care in the pandemic because of how stressful it was and the exposure. So there's a s- staffing shortage. They're not being paid good, you know, well enough. Um, there's a lot there. So that hugely impacts if somebody has some kind of caregiving responsibility that greatly impacts their ability to show up and do their job well. Yeah. Yeah. And especially as a woman, you know, when you have a child, you step out of the workforce for um, sometimes up to a year or two years, and then you come back in and you lost the valuable time in the career right, as well. And that can affect your... Well, I will say it's all genders, right? I mean, like it's a lot of, you know, it's not always the woman, but yeah, it does. And the longer you stay out, the typically the harder it is to get back in. Yeah. And that's what we're seeing what's happening is in 2020, a lot of schools, you know, shut down and were virtual for a year or two. And people had to leave jobs, and now there's not enough childcare uh, facilities or pla- daycare, you know, daycare places anymore. And so we're seeing a lot of people not go back to work because it's actually cheaper for them to stay home than go back to work. Yep. Yeah. Definitely. Um, so last question. So what can mm-hmm. uh, they do for themselves to be treated more equitably? For the people with caregiving responsibilities? Yeah, yeah. The uh, yeah, I was talking about specifically about Latina women, but oh yeah, yeah. Example. Well, I think one is again, you know, a lot of the progress we need to see around uh, closing the gender pay gap and closing all the pay gaps is really going to be driven from organizations. Is looking at your information, looking at your pay data, looking at your hiring practices, looking at your, you know, workplace policies. Again, there's a, you know, the rise of remote work is not just people don't want to go in the office. Sometimes it's because it's literally kind of, you know, maybe for people who are immunocompromised, it might be life-saving, or maybe they just, um, it decreases transportation costs enough for them to be able to afford daycare. Mm -hmm. Um, So, organizations have really got to kind of get clear again. That's why I work, you know, with them on compensation philosophy is that who are you trying to employ? What do you believe about them and what kind of workplace do you want to offer them? And a lot of times that's going to be driven through your HR policies and practices. Yeah. 
Excellent. Well, this was a wonderful discussion, Sally. Um, I'm glad we had a good discussion on on this specific top, topic of pay equity. Um, where can people reach you and learn more about you know your work um, and your uh, philosophy on this? Yes, you can reach me. Definitely a great place to find me is on LinkedIn. I'm there um, most days of the week and publish pretty frequently there. Also publish a monthly newsletter called Fully Human Resources, where I cover a different human resources topic each month and do interviews and things like that. The other places you can uh, reach me at our uh, firm's website, loftuspartners.com, which I know you'll have this in the show notes. And you can kind of see a little bit about our services, have a blog there, and just read a little bit more about what we're doing. Excellent. Well, thank you, Sally. It was a pleasure. Thank you. Shri Chalapa here. Thank you so much for listening to the People Strategy Leaders Podcast. If you are a successful leader or a people strategist who would like to be on this program, please visit engagedly.com slash people strategy leaders podcast. If you got something out of this interview, would you share this episode on social media? If you know someone that would be a great guest, tag them on social media to let them know about the show and include the hashtag people strategy leaders. I love seeing your posts and guest suggestions. We are regularly putting out new episodes and content to make sure you don't miss any episodes. Go ahead and subscribe your thumbs up ratings and reviews go a long way to help promote the show and mean a lot to me and my team want to know more follow me on linkedin and twitter at sri chalapa thanks for listening we will see you next time and thank you to patrick ramsey sound engineer at kalinga production studios for recording and mixing this show